Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. We're going to get started in about one minute. Well, great. I'm going to go ahead and get started. I uh, want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, a few housekeeping items. I guess maybe first uh, and foremost to thank you. I know that uh, I'm uh, directly competing with the Michael Cohen testimony this morning, so uh, uh, appreciate all of you uh, who've uh, made it to your computers or telephones for today's presentation. I hope uh, you'll be able to derive uh, some some good information out of it. A couple of additional housekeeping items, uh, you know, from a housekeeping perspective, uh, we have muted the lines to try and help uh, preserve good audio quality. Um, however, uh, I do want to try and take as many questions as is possible over the course of the presentation. So you'll notice uh, in the Zoom app the ability to uh, ask questions uh, as we go along. You know, I'll try to address those, any that I can't address, I'll try and pick up uh, after the fact with uh, the questioner directly. Uh, another uh, housekeeping item, so today's materials uh, will be provided uh, to attendees um, after the fact, so you should probably expect the uh, latter part of this week, perhaps early uh, next, to get a copy, uh, both of the, the print materials as well as uh, a link to the audio recording, uh, assuming I don't say anything uh, uh, too uh, uh, too stupid over the course of uh, today's hour presentation. Uh, my name is Eric Daly. Uh, I'm the managing principal of Multnomah Group, uh, and I'm really pleased to be with you today to talk about uh, some recent developments uh, on the 403B plan litigation side, and some of which are very, very recent, including an announcement uh, yesterday uh, related to one of the pending cases, which I'll try and touch on um, over the course of today's presentation. The other thing I'd like to point out, uh, for those who know me, I am uh, not an attorney, so what I've discussed today is certainly the status of these cases, um, uh, and frankly, much of which has been uh, <clears throat> uh, educated to me by some of the fantastic uh, ERISA attorneys we've had the opportunity to work with, uh, so I'm thankful to them. But as we go through today's presentation, it'll be very fact-oriented. I'll try and limit uh, my inaccurate, uh, not legal opinions, uh, keep those to a very minimum as we go through today's content. Um, so kind of starting off, um, I think it's important to look back on uh, on 2018. It was um, a very interesting year uh, relative what's happening uh, both in higher education, but but clearly what's happening uh, relative to retirement plans and litigation. I think uh, very clearly from a governmental perspective, uh, we've seen a, a pretty significant uh, pullback uh, in the regulatory environment. So if we look at a budget perspective, uh, the DOL's budget uh, was cut by 21% uh, in 2019. Uh, the DOL fiduciary rule, where uh, many of you have probably read, participated in webinars, read white papers uh, upon the impact of how that would uh, affect retirement plans, vendors, disclosures, and other things, uh, was finally eliminated uh, in 2018 after, uh, I won't even call it a lengthy court battle, it was actually very, uh, very short <laughs> uh, relative to the process there. Uh, we have seen, you know, congressional action in some limited areas uh, relative retirement plans, um, specifically related to hardship distributions, and, and many of you and your committees were probably addressing uh, modifications to rules related to distribution toward the end of the year. The one area of continued discussion um, has to do with the coverage gap, and the coverage gap is this um, real uh, phenomenon. Uh, wherein small employers uh, tend not to have uh, qualified retirement plans, and as a result, small employers um, aren't providing retirement benefits, and the employees of those organizations are more likely uh, to be behind from a retirement savings perspective. So you see in a couple of things, both uh, uh, on the executive order side, uh, as far as discussion about uh, modifying rules related to multiple employer plans and letting uh, a large number of smaller employers potentially bundle together uh, to sponsor a qualified plan. Um, and while MEPs or multiple employer plans have been around for some time, 
the executive order is designed to try and clarify uh, and create some safe harbors relative to that structure. The other thing we've seen, uh, which is outside the federal uh, structure, clearly uh, is a, a, a pretty aggressive movement uh, among many states across the country uh, to try and create state-governed uh, and state-maintained small employer retirement plans. Uh, so uh, I reside in the state of Oregon. Oregon has uh, put together one of the uh, earliest and arguably most effective of those programs uh, using an auto contribution IRA structure uh, called Oregon Phase to try and create a uh, not a an ERISA governed retirement plan structure, but an alternative uh, that might provide some retirement savings benefits uh, to employees of smaller organizations. You know, if we look at the litigation update, and this is really what this is designed to be, I think um, while it's focused on 403Bs, I'm going to touch on some non-403B cases. And I do think that ultimately, uh, while much of the focus has been on these 403B plans from a litigation perspective, um, I think what we can learn from those 403B plans is certainly applicable to the 401k or the for-profit side of the universe. So if we look at the litigation claims, I think they've resided uh, primarily in one area. Uh, this notion of excessive fee, the fact that you as a plan sponsor um, have provided a retirement plan, that particular retirement plan um, is uh, assessing expenses to participants that are higher than they would reasonably need to be. Uh, and the impact of that uh, is a significant loss to participants, especially in aggregate. Uh, we have seen some self-dealing cases. The self-dealing cases have by and large been related to financial service organizations utilizing their own investment products uh, and the potential damage that that may cause. So I'm not going to touch on that dramatically, but as we look at the data from 2006 through 2017, it's really, really clear that the focus um, of uh, the litigants on the plaintiff side has been uh, disproportionately changing from inappropriate investment choices to excessive fees uh, and self-dealing. I, I think if you look at excessive fees across multi-billion dollar plans, you know, over multi-year periods of time compounded with interest, the, the potential financial damage related to an excessive fee case is obviously pretty significant. Uh, and in some ways, uh, it, it may be easier uh, for a plaintiff's group to prove an excessive fee type arrangement than it would be an inappropriate investment choice, right? Which is, we made an investment choice, we picked product A at this point in time, uh, demonstrating that that would have potentially been the, the wrong choice at the time or that it was made imprudently uh, creates some challenges, I think, that an excessive fee case perhaps does not. Uh, and I think that ultimately, if we look at the 403B cases, it's a combination of inappropriate investment choices uh, combined with excessive fees. Very rarely do you see a self-dealing component, although there's at least one of those that we can talk about as, uh, over the course of today's presentation. Um, there has been some awfully good news. Uh, and the good news is, as we look at the cases that were out there that were filed uh, largely in concert, um, so far, there's been a tremendous amount of success uh, on the plan sponsor side. Um, so if we look at Sacredo uh, v. NYU, uh, that trial went through and resulted in zero dollars in damages for the plaintiffs. Uh, we saw it went now as seven cases uh, where the judges have dismissed the case prior to trial. Uh, Georgetown, Washington U, Northwestern, uh, Penn, uh, as well as some 401k cases related to Chevron, Gannett, uh, and capital group companies. Uh, we've also seen, in, at least in two cases, where plaintiffs uh, have dropped their case. So University of Rochester and Long Island University, where prior to even getting to uh, a judgment from a trial judge, uh, those particular plaintiffs have chosen to pull back. Um, important to point out that these aren't definitive in each and every case, other than the ones that have been dropped by the plaintiffs. Uh, these cases uh, are now uh, up for appeal, uh, so uh, these aren't going to go away anytime soon, uh, but there has been at least a pretty significant drive uh, towards success for, uh, for the defendants or the plan sponsors relative to the claims of the plaintiffs. So as we look at the 5403B cases where the court found for the defendant either a trial or the motion to dismiss, um, one of the good things, I think, is that we're beginning to see some commonality of language uh, appear through the language uh, issued by judges in those cases where 
uh, a plaintiffs lack standing because <clears throat> they may not have invested in or demonstrated a loss as a result uh, of investing in a specific fund. Uh, B, that the plaintiffs have failed to allege any factual support for the allegations of imprudence. I think that one's really, really exciting, right? The notion that the fact that an investment option may not have performed well um, is not in and of itself a breach, right? There's the imprudence that went into the selection of the investment vehicle uh, and a number of the initial claims certainly didn't include any detail related to um, uh, an imprudence relative to the decision-making process. <clears throat> Pardon me, C, plaintiffs failed to acknowledge uh, the different regulatory framework of 403B plans. While certainly 401Ks and 403Bs uh, are subject to the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, if you, if you look at um, you know, much of the decision in the Sacredo case and, and the testimony related to that, uh, there was important work done in that particular case to try and uh, delineate the historical and regulatory differences between 403B plans uh, and 401k plans. And I, and I do think that fundamentally there are some significant differences. If I were to look across our, uh, our, our book of clients, which has a, a strong mix of both, they're very significantly different in, in vendor makeup, investment product construction, how they communicate to participants. Uh, and again, uh, recognizing those instead of using 401ks as being uh, the uh, the best practice for a defined contribution, understanding that 403Bs may have a distinct uh, and different set of best practices. And again, the last, the, the plaintiff's failure to demonstrate imprudence, uh, not just arguing the impact or the result, uh, but again, uh, more of a focus on uh, plaintiffs make, needing to make a case relative to process instead of merely uh, assessing the outcome six, seven years after the fact. So I want to go through uh, knowing that there's been a lot of success. Uh, there have been now one, two, and, and uh, as of yesterday, uh, three different cases uh, where ultimately the defendants have elected to settle. Uh, the first of those uh, was in the University of Chicago case back in May of 2018. Uh, where ultimately uh, uh, the uh, defendants agreed to a six and a half million dollar deposit uh, in the settlement fund. Uh, in agreement, and in addition, the University of Chicago has agreed not to increase their per participant record keeping fees uh, for at least three years. And, and interestingly, agreed to use commercially reasonable best efforts to continue to attempt to reduce record keeping fees. If we look back, and there's you know, clearly a, a singular uh, plaintiff's firm that is responsible for the overwhelming majority uh, of class action litigation, certainly relative uh, 403B plans, but even prior to that, had had a tremendous amount of success on the 401k side, and that's Schlichter, Bogart, and Denton out of uh, St. Louis. Uh, if you look back at a number of the settlements that Schlichter was able to solicit uh, from 401k defendants, um, one of the commonalities uh, was an RFP process every two, three, five years that the, the defendants would ultimately agree to in addition to whatever monetary damages uh, they had agreed to deposit to a settlement fund. At least in the case of University of Chicago, uh, the ultimate settlement was to use commercially reasonable best efforts to continue to attempt to reduce record keeping fees. Uh, I think an acknowledgement that the effort uh, that goes into uh, having to run uh, RFP processes for, you know, for for record keeping and administrative services every two, three, five years um, are significant and potentially could actually have a, a pretty significant cost uh, to the plan if ultimately participants are the ones uh, shouldering the burden of that and instead using um, what you know we ultimately think is just effect just as effective in many cases which is benchmarking fees and services relative to the marketplace uh, i think that's a good direction ultimately for these types of settlements i do think ultimately there is a clearly a responsibility from the department of labor to monitor fees and to do that regularly uh, i am not sure uh, that ultimately rfp is the most effective it can be an effective way uh, but may not, may not, depending on the time horizon, be the most effective way. Uh, prior to the settlement, uh, the University of Chicago had already been in the process and rolled out in April uh, a new investment lineup that ultimately reduced the total number of investment options. You know, clearly, if you look across the higher education landscape, whether it's multiple vendor or single vendor with a tremendous number of investment options, the, the recurring claim uh, from plaintiffs uh, is that the menus have been too large. Uh, 
uh, and it ultimately that has been a disadvantageous to participants. That particular claim has not been uh, particularly successful uh, up until this point. So even in cases where uh, the uh, the lawsuits have proceeded, and in some instances, the claims of too many investment options themselves um, have been dismissed as a single claim as part of uh, as part of the suit. Uh, additionally. Uh, one of the uh, quote unquote underperforming investment options, at least relative to plaintiff's claims, uh, was the Crest stock variable annuity. Uh, the Crest stock variable annuity uh, had uh, uh, was removed as part of the reconstruction uh, at the University of Chicago back in April. Um, more recently, going back now to December of, of 2018, there was an announcement of settlement in the Clark v. Duke University case. Uh, settlement a little larger here, ten and a half, a little more than ten and a half million dollars. Uh, a new menu lineup that needs to be rolled out. So unlike the Duke, or pardon me, unlike the University of Chicago case where the investment menu had already been locked down, um, you know clearly there's some still some work to be done at Duke as they go through this process. Uh, the assets held at two of the uh, multiple providers ultimately uh, at Duke will be mapped to the new Fidelity platform. It'll be the provider going forward. Uh, and you know Duke has agreed to obviously consider uh, investment alternatives, relative costs and share classes, and and uh, revenue sharing rebates, which um, you know I think all prudent plan sponsors should be doing now and likely are. Uh, but so ultimately agreeing to do that prospectively, since it's a a requirement, I would argue of ERISA probably is not a, a big give in the case of uh, in the case of Duke. Um, Duke also agreed to engage an independent fiduciary, and I think. This is a, a not an unimportant piece, I think, for plan sponsors to consider uh, their expertise internally relative to what they may need to purchase externally uh, to assist with that partic particular process, whether it's the investment selection process or it's the RFP for record keeping services. I think, you know, having worked with a number of governmental institutions and tax exempt institutions, um, the procurement of record keeping administration investment services is is very difficult uh, and many procurement departments lack the expertise or the sophistication to do that uh, without external counsel so having external expertise to even assist a, a, what is a very qualified procurement process i think is certainly wise for plan sponsors to consider the big issue in the duke case which at least at this point is unique relative to the others uh, was a claim uh, that uh, Duke University was using plan assets to pay employees during uh, uh, the prior, uh, the, the year being reviewed or the years being reviewed by the plaintiffs. So essentially what was happening is plan expenses were paying for benefit staff, compensation wages, and other things. Um, while not expressly prohibited under the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, it is uncommon uh, to, to try and use plan assets to pay uh, uh, employees who may be uh, employed by the plan sponsor organization. Uh, the work that would be required to document the accuracy of, of that compensation and the reasonableness of it uh, is typically determined to be uh, excessive or, or too much work relative to the cost. Um, so that particular piece uh, may or may not uh, have contributed to, to why Duke uh, elected to settle this case in December. But again, does make it unique relative to some of the other cases out there. Uh, and Duke has agreed not to use plan assets to pay employees during the settlement period. So likely that particular practice at Duke uh, uh, looks like it may be discontinued going forward. The last case uh, was just announced yesterday. So Vanderbilt University has agreed uh, to settle with its 40,000 uh, participant member class, participant and former participant member class. Uh, the charges there are very, very similar to the charges ultimately at the University of Chicago and ultimately the charges at, at Duke, which was uh, that uh, the plaintiffs argued that they, the plan was overcharging participants for administrative services uh, and investing in, in poorly performing investment products. So the details, the financial amount of the settlement uh, likely not going to be available for at least another couple of months. Uh, details should be available on April the 22nd. The other thing that we pointed out in other blog posts uh, that we've written about the litigation out there in the marketplace that's unique about the Vanderbilt case um, is that ultimately one of the chain, one of the claims of the plaintiffs uh, was that ultimately uh, financial information or private information about participants was being provided to record keepers 
uh, in the plan and that ultimately record keepers in the plan were using that information to solicit other uh, services, cross sales uh, to participants in the Vanderbilt case. So it'll be interesting on April 22nd when we take a look at uh, the agreed terms of settlement in that particular case, um, to what extent or how much uh, of the unique factors relative to this particular settlement uh, may be related to that particular claim. Because as we look at the environment of litigation going forward, clearly that's going to be an interesting area, right? We've seen this modification of uh, bad investment options, which were by and large employer stock and stock drop cases, uh, to excessive fees and self-dealing in the case of financial services institutions. Uh, if ultimately uh, a, a, a nimble plaintiffs group like Schlichter, Bogart, and Denton uh, can transition now to uh, the, the somehow that there's a fiduciary breach for providing information relative participants in the plan back out, and likely that would start another set of cases. So interesting to see from a, a wins and losses perspective, and I'm sure the plaintiffs would argue that losses aren't losses, especially when they're still up for appeal. Um, but ultimately, uh, the, 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 the trend of settlement seems to be more in favor of, of defendants who have been more willing, at least to this point, and I think we're still pretty early in the process, uh, to try and fight the claims. Um, also important to point out that ultimately uh, the degree to which these cases continue to proceed or multiply um, is going to be impacted by how successful uh, the plaintiff's attorneys are. So if we just look at uh, the Duke case and the University of Chicago case, uh, across those two cases you're looking at roughly $16, $17 million uh, in settlement. In a worst case scenario, at least if you look at the Duke case, I think in the case of Duke, defense, or pardon me, the plaintiff's attorneys are entitled to 30% plus legal costs. So if you say 30% is the low end, that means you know Schlichter, Bogart, and Denton's $5 million in uh, as far as their portion of the settlements that may be out there plus some additional legal expenses. Uh, to what extent uh, that's enough to get them to continue these cases and, and perhaps add more uh, potential uh, defendants uh, uh, to the uh, to the proceedings, or again, whether they choose to ultimately uh, reorient and, and move toward a, a different type of target market, uh, I think is yet to be determined. Uh, again, uh, with the Vanderbilt case, given the size of the case, uh, we would expect that that'll add some additional money to the coffers uh, and would, again, have some impact on the likelihood of cases proceeding uh, against additional higher education institutions. I did want to get into the one case uh, that's made its way through the courts, both A, because I think there's some really good facts uh, relative, uh, you know, process obligations. It was well constructed, uh, but also because it's got a bunch of interesting information in it uh, relative to uh, the appeal process. So Sacred Oak NYU is the only case to make it all the way through the court. And uh, back in July, uh, the district court held that the committee did not breach its fiduciary duty. Um, ultimately, uh, the plaintiffs did file two post-judgment motions uh, after the decision. Uh, the first uh, requested an amendment to the decision to remove two individuals from the committee. So if you actually read the decision, and it's, it's well-written and interesting and written in a way I think that's ultimately uh, pretty accessible uh, for anybody who's on a committee, uh, a couple of committee members were, were called out for their lack of knowledge relative to their fiduciary obligations, whether they were fiduciaries, when they were fiduciaries. Uh, those uh, particular individuals still uh, served in a capacity of the committee. So clearly the plaintiffs uh, pointing out in the judge's decision the failures of those particular committee members uh, and requesting that they be removed. Um, ultimately, uh, the, the the good decision part of this is that uh, the at least the court decision held that you know having a bad committee member does not a bad committee make so you know clearly having a strong committee uh, that's going to have members who are stronger or weaker as long as the, the overall decisions made by the committee are, are prudent uh, I think is uh, uh, is certainly uh, uh, promising from a a plan sponsor perspective uh, the second is the plaintiffs requested a new trial. Uh, the judge, uh, in their uh, in their opinion, should have recused herself. Uh, shortly after issuing the uh, opinion relative Sacred Oak NYU, she retired from the bench uh, and joined a law firm whose chairman is on the executive committee of the NYU Board of Trustees, who oversees the retirement committee. 
Um, so ultimately, that will be uh, the leg upon which the uh, Sacerdote NYU uh, appeal is made. Um, it'll be clearly interesting to see how that played out. The court has not yet ruled on the plaintiff's additional motions. Uh, NYU, uh, as you would expect, uh, responded that there was no evidence that the judge should have recused herself. Um, she had been with that firm previously and had disclosed that prior to going in. Uh, the plaintiffs included declarations from a couple of different federal court judges saying that she should have recused. Uh, NYU filed a response saying that you know, federal judges aren't experts. Those are just their opinions. Uh, and ultimately, there was oral arguments on these particular issues back in January of 2019, but we don't have yet uh, any updates. Uh, the other case uh, from a higher education perspective or a 403B perspective that I think is 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 interesting is, is Monroe uh, v. USC. Uh, in the Monroe v. USC, we have not yet had dismissal. dismissal. We're still proceeding through the process. Uh, but ultimately, defense counsel in the USC case uh, claimed that uh, participants uh, should have abided by an arbitration agreement uh, as part of their employment. Uh, and ultimately, the district judge ruled that arbitration agreements did not prevent uh, plaintiffs from filing ERISA claims on behalf of plans. So um, while USC had been hopeful uh, that the Supreme Court might ultimately uh, review the issue uh, and, and decide in favor of, uh, of the defense and that you know, these issues should have been uh, arbitrated rather than, than being settled by an ERISA case in the district court, uh, the Supreme Court elected not to take that particular case up, and as a result, we don't have any any significant change other than the ruling in the district court, which at that point would be precedent. We do have a potential Supreme Court case, and I think this one has a much higher likelihood uh, of making it there than the USC Monroe case, um, and this has to do with uh, Putnam, uh, where Putnam uh, was accused of self-dealing in the circuit court. Uh, and pointed out uh, a distinct uh, difference uh, between the various circuit courts across the country uh, and really has to do with proof of causation of law. So if you're in an ERISA case, uh, you got to prove you're imprudent. You got to prove that uh, the imprudence caused you to lose, uh, part, part, part of, pardon me, caused you to lose economically uh, relative that uh, relative to the decision that was made. Uh, so when we talk about the causation of loss, if you look at the first, fourth, fifth, and eighth circuits, uh, they say they say the uh, burden of proof related to causation of loss is the defendant's. So you've been accused of it. You, therefore, as the defendant, have to prove uh, that uh, you didn't uh, cause the loss. In the sixth, seventh, ninth, tenth, and eleventh, uh, the burden is on the plaintiff. And and you know I think uh, attorneys would generally state that burden of proof is a pretty significant uh, issue relative to the likelihood of being successful in a court case. So with a difference in the districts, uh, these are cases that are more likely than not to be pulled up uh, by the Supreme Court. So ultimately, they can weigh in and settle in this particular issue where the burden of proof lies. Uh, again, this is the burden of proof relative causation of law. So uh, while it's going to have an impact uh, on uh, ERISA cases that go forward, it probably isn't the only issue uh, and arguably may not even be the most significant issue, uh, but it's always exciting. We get very few cases of, of ERISA nature, or retirement plan nature that ultimately roll up to the Supreme Court. So this will be an interesting one to watch if ultimately uh, they agree to hear it. Um, I do think there's some additional cases that are on the horizon that tax exempt employers, 403B employers, and I would argue um, even uh, ultimately uh, 401k providers should be aware of, um, one of which uh, is Carlson versus ConAgra. So we talk about the three primary issues, uh, investment performance, fees, and self-dealing. Um, Carlson ConAgra is none of those. Carlson ConAgra is an allegation that the plan sponsor failed to apply the correct definition of compensation. In this case, you have an employee who worked in benefits, uh, was aware of the compensation definition being used incorrectly and is suing for a fiduciary breach. Uh, this is probably not the type of case that from a class action perspective is very exciting because ultimately, uh, if you look at definition of compensation, the amount of total benefit lost is not as significant as would probably get somebody like Schlichter, Bogart, and Denton excited, but it does uh, relate back to something that we talk to plan sponsors about all the time, and that is the notion that 
ultimately, uh, your fiduciary obligation is to follow the terms of the plan document to the extent that it complies with ERISA. So not using uh, the appropriate or correct definition of compensation is a fiduciary breach and ultimately one that could find you in a courtroom, uh, especially by those who are aware of the definition of compensation and how that works. The big challenge continues to be for tax exempt providers uh, is refining and accurately using definition of compensation. Uh, we see uh, whether it's in higher education related to stipends and inclusion or exclusion of those, uh, we see uh, overload compensation for healthcare districts uh, related to uh, nursing staff that comes in. Having the correct and accurate definition of compensation and then monitoring and auditing that on a recurring basis, I would argue, is one of the more difficult things to do for plan sponsors. Uh, but time spent there is almost always time well spent because uh, you'll learn more about your process and, and be able to refine that in ways that are appropriate. Um, back to one of the additional issues we were talking about this, uh, it goes back really to the Vanderbilt case underneath, uh, the notion that ultimately plan sponsors are not doing an adequate job of monitoring uh, the sales process uh, back to plan participants. Uh, there's the Davis versus Stadium Money Management case that alleges that the uh, retirement plan provider uh, abused their managed account arrangements, uh, putting their own interests ahead of the interest of participants. Uh, meaning that ultimately the plan providers in this case were selling managed accounts in places where they may not have been appropriate. They were earning significant fees in exchange for that uh, and that ultimately that would have an impact. There's probably two elements of that. You know, clearly one is on the service provider. Uh, the second is going to potentially be on the plan fiduciary who should have been monitoring uh, any of those expenses related to plan services. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we kind of proceed over today's presentation. And the last is this Cassell v. Vanderbilt case, which again, I think was why the April 23rd uh, release of the settlement terms will be interesting because in this particular case, uh, the plaintiffs alleged that Vanderbilt allowed the record keeper to obtain access to participants, thereby gaining valuable private sensitive information and allowing them to sell products and services to the plan participants. Frequently, those, those products and services were not uh, within the plan. So they may have been IRAs, insurance products, uh, managed account services, 529 services, a number of various things. Um, I think that's a very difficult case to make in a court of law, but it'll be interesting to see ultimately what Vanderbilt agrees to do relative to these cross-sell opportunities. We've written a, a series of blog posts. I think we have a white paper coming out next month. Uh, relative how retirement plan providers are monetizing uh, their relationships uh, with plan sponsors. And ultimately, uh, the likelihood that they're doing that by trying to uh, add additional revenue sources directly with participants. So being aware of that, certainly watching what's happening uh, from a legal landscape perspective um, so that you can be aware of, of best practices and, and certainly review things that you might want to do as plan sponsors. Uh, to ensure that that information that they need, frankly, to do things like file 5500s, uh, provide disclosures, do uh, uh, retirement readiness assessments, that that data that we is, is so necessary and useful to helping run the plan um, is being used in the interest of plan participants and not at their expense. Which really gets us to these monitoring potential conflicts. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I do think it touches on the Stadium case. I do think it touches on the Vanderbilt case and the settlement there. You know, plan record keepers uh, are almost in very, in, not, in many cases, not all cases, in most cases, are attempting to monitor, monetize other aspects of their relationship with the participants. So clearly proprietary funds, so whether it's in the cases with financial services companies that are using their own funds, but even in the case of any of these higher education institutions that are partnering with one or more providers to provide record keeping, administration, and other services uh, back to plan participants, we're finding a high level of frequency, and the Department of Labor has written about it relative you know, target date funds, where within those record keeping relationships, the providers are using proprietary investment options. So to what extent is the record keeping relationship a primary avenue through which to sell investment products, which tend to have a much higher margin uh, than record keeping administration. So in the Stadium case specifically, uh, 
uh, and I think we'll continue to see this, we're seeing the prevalence or expansion of managed account services. And managed account services being, uh, we have an underlying investment venue. Uh, I turn over the keys to managing my own participant account back to the provider uh, in exchange for additional compensation. So again, to what extent uh, are those products being sell, sold to the right participants and are we monitoring services and costs relative to that sale within the plan? Uh, clearly, IRA rollovers, which was, uh, I would argue, the primary focus of the fiduciary rule was to address and clean up practices relative IRA rollovers or rollovers out of the plan into an individual retirement account where a participant may go from an institutionally set, an institutionally priced set of investments to potentially a retail uh, oriented set of investments uh, continues to be a huge revenue opportunity uh, for participants or for plan providers, pardon me. Uh, in the case of Vanderbilt, we're really talking about cross-selling of products and services outside the plan. So I have data about where you live, how much you make, how much you've accumulated, how old you are. And am I using that data to sell you products uh, that may not be part of my retirement plan, but are certainly part of my organization? And, and what's the compensation relative to that? Uh, and the last, and I think you know, the final frontier, as we call it, is this notion of annuitization. We are uh, in the process of uh, the baby boom generation uh, fully entering retirement. Uh, and we've seen uh, a, a huge uh, push among, especially insurance companies that that uh, that work on the utilization side to communicate the benefits of annuitizing an accumulated defined contribution benefit, right? Transitioning that pot of money uh, into a lifetime paycheck. Uh, I think that will continue. Uh, I think we've seen, certainly seen product innovation there and and clearly, uh, from an opportunistic perspective of our financial services organization, the profitability opportunity there is pretty significant. So monitoring conflicts, I, I think that given the, the multi-pronged nature of, of so many financial services organizations, uh, it should not be surprising to anybody that there are potential conflicts. I think uh, the important thing for plan uh, sponsors to do is fiduciaries to protect participants is to make sure they're aware of the conflicts, they disclose the conflicts, they control the conflicts, and that the conflicts don't drive uh, the relationship with their provider. There was an additional piece that came out late last year that I think also highlights something that we're watching. Um, because we work in the tax exempt space and in the 401k defined contribution space, Plan sponsors are understandably watching litigation to see what they should learn from that process. Uh, and I think it's um, an unintended consequence that ultimately as plan sponsors, we tend to react even prior to the outcome of these cases, right? Um, so if we look at the litigation, we look at the, uh, the, the claims that are made as part of the litigation, especially in this latest state uh, of uh, 403B cases and say, well, uh, what are the consequences of the litigation? How are plan sponsors reacting to the claims made in those cases? And I think uh, the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College did a really great paper uh, that I think I pushed out in a bit, maybe via my, my Twitter, uh, you know, back on Monday. But ultimately, they, 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 they related this to perhaps four different consequences. They certainly have seen uh, greater uses of, usage of passive investment options or index investment options uh, within uh, defined contribution plans. Uh, we certainly have seen a reduction in the number of asset classes offered in core menus. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, too many investment options or repetitive investment options is a recurring claim, at least in the uh, 403B cases that are out there, not a particularly successful claim, at least to this point, uh, but a claim nonetheless, and I think we have seen a reduction in the number of asset classes and investment products offered. Uh, increases in fee transparency. Ultimately, um, I might argue that the increases in, in fee transparency was being driven uh, by other factors. Um, uh, if we look at the, the changes to the 5500 and the necessity to disclose those things, if we look at the 404 uh, A5 filings that we have to make with participants to disclose those costs, and ultimately, uh, the, the belief that increasing fee transparency is positive. But, but litigation, I think, also is, is a component of that, uh, which is we, we want everybody to know what they pay. Uh, we all want to be on the same page, and we want to be as transparent about that um, as the complexity of defined contribution plans uh, 
uh, mail out. And, and the last, and I think one that's an unfortunate consequence, uh, is ultimately a reticence to innovate, right? As plan sponsors, um, there is a understandable desire not to get out ahead of uh, the regulatory environment, the safe harbors that are created either by the Department of Labor uh, or the Internal Revenue Service. And uh, as we look at the potential to be sued, um, not wanting to be in a small number uh, of peers uh, taking risks uh, where we may ultimately not be uh, rewarded as fiduciaries for those risks. So I wanted to highlight just some of the data points related to that to give you a, a, a feel for scope. The increase in exposure uh, to index types investments uh, has grown uh, absolutely rapidly. <laughs> Um, if we look at the claims related to these uh, uh, plaintiffs' class action cases, inappropriate investment cases, uh, and excessive and self-dealing cases have, have really dominated, as I reported earlier and showed you some data on. So if you go back to two, 2007, there was $9.5 trillion uh, ultimately uh, in, uh, in, in these kind of collective investment products. And we looked at that, 85% of it. Uh, was in actively managed products, only about 15 in indexes and index ETFs. A, a mere 10 years later, that's shrunk uh, to 65% of the marketplace, uh, and where 35% uh, of asset, the collective assets are within index strategies. Um, if you look at that from a flow perspective, it's really dramatic, right? We're looking at contributions to passive, which is in this case blue, and redemptions ultimately uh, from active from 2006 back through 2017. So we are getting a significant amount of net redemptions uh, out of equity funds uh, on the actively managed side uh, and having those dollars flow back into uh, what should be, at least in this case, low cost index alternatives um, as options. And we see that dominated, frankly, on the defined contribution side. Uh, where we've seen tremendous changes in, in flow relative core options uh, and extended options and where dollars tend to reside. You know, the second thing I talked about was this reduction in the number of asset classes offered. Uh, the number of designated investment alternatives or DIAs is certainly on the decline, especially in the tax exempt side. Where in 403B plans, we did see this prevalence of here's all the investment options from provider A, provider B, provider C. Um, and at least over some period of time, pre-2008, certainly, and in some cases even post-2008, um, a failure to review appropriateness across DIAs, review costs across DIAs. As we've seen this huge movement toward consolidation, um, we have seen uh, menus shrink, and in some cases shrink dramatically, right, from multiple hundred investment options down to 15, 18, 20, 40, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, the number of high quality asset or high volatility, pardon me, asset classes being eliminated uh, is pretty significant. I think, uh, and I think this is probably a good outcome where ultimately uh, fiduciaries and plan sponsors are making a determination about what types of investment products should we have as DIAs where participants can allocate and build portfolios. We're seeing a number of diversifier asset classes eliminated. So if we go back to the high volatility, we look at the number of uh, uh, sector funds, tech funds, telecommunications funds, healthcare funds, uh, even emerging market, high yield debt, those types of investment allocations are reducing in number. If we look at the diversifier asset classes, we're seeing a reduction in the number of things like commodities. Uh, the interest that we, you know, folks may have had a decade ago in gold funds or things like that has certainly uh, reduced pretty significantly. And a growing acknowledgement of the role of self-directed brokerage accounts to address participants who may have unique needs, where they do want uh, high volatility or diversifier asset classes. But I think the difference being that ultimately, uh, as a result of uh, the, the litigation that we've seen out there, plan sponsors are doing a much more thoughtful process about putting together investment menus that work well for the least sophisticated participants. In the case where they may have highly sophisticated uh, participants, giving them avenues outside the DIA or the designated investment alternative uh, menus to execute that level of flexibility. Increased fee transparency. And increased fee transparency has been unquestionably 
the the best result of the changes in the last decade, the movement toward helping participants better understand what the actual cost is, removing costs from embedded investment options, allocating costs directly to participants in whatever manner uh, the uh, the committee and fiduciaries view is being most effective. If we look at the cost of investment options, be they balanced funds, equity funds, or bond funds over the course of the last 20 years, costs have come down. Um, investment uh, assets have gone up more rapidly than costs have come down, uh, but costs have come down. Uh, and part of that has been that despite the fact that assets have increased dramatically, the number of investment products trying to gather market share uh, in those asset classes continues to rise as well. I think competition continues to drive investment costs. I think if you look at the movement, even on the index side, we've experienced in this battle between uh, Barclays, Vanguard, and Fidelity relative to their passive investment product. The ultimate winners in that type of competition uh, are investors who ultimately uh, arrive at a better, lower cost, passive structure. We've seen similar things on the active managed side. Now, as I was mentioning earlier, the Schedule C on the 5500, the 404A5 disclosures to participants uh, have highlighted the issue of transparency. While many participants don't read their 404A5 filings, most committees are aware of those filings and certainly want to make sure that they're comfortable with what's being disclosed to participants. There has been consolidation and competition and technology. Uh, those things clearly have helped reduce record keeping administration costs. Um, it is driving us to a narrower and narrower number of providers in the marketplace. Uh, but at least at this point, the, the, the end impact of that appears to be uh, reduced costs in some areas. And ultimately, it's moving plan sponsors to have a very complicated and difficult discussion uh, about how to reconcile the issues of fee reasonableness and fee equity. Uh, and I think there's a huge difference between the two, right? So if you look at the lawsuits, the, 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 the issue of the lawsuits or the plaintiff's cases in these 403B cases has to do with, were my fees reasonable? And ultimately, were my fees reasonable is a core fiduciary duty for any committee to wrestle. But in wrestling the issue of making my fees reasonable, and thereby making them more transparent to participants, I ultimately have to get to the issue of, well, what's the fairest way to allocate those expenses? So I think fee reasonableness and fee equity can get confused. So we try and break it down relatively simply. So uh, I've got a committee meeting this afternoon and if uh, after the committee meeting, uh, the, me and four of the committee members go out uh, afterward to, to, to uh, talk about the committee mem direction and where we're going and we ring up a bill of $150, uh, you know, with apps and a bottle of wine. The question is, was the $150 reasonable? Yep, it was a nice bottle of wine. We had some apps. It makes perfect sense. How ultimately do we allocate the bill? Uh, I didn't drink because I was the, uh, the reasonable, responsible fiduciary and I only had uh, two of the popcorn shrimp. Am I on the hook for $30 of the 150 uh, or do I need to pay some rated cost relative uh, to uh, 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 to how much I consumed over the course of the meeting? This is going to be a critical issue, likely not one that's going to be litigated, right? Because the issue of was the fee allocated appropriately between participants is not one where a contingency-oriented plaintiff's attorney is going to make much money. Taking money out of your account and putting it in my account because I should have paid less than you should have paid more likely uh, isn't particularly attractive. But as we move to an environment where fees are entirely transparent, this is an issue that I think committees are going to be wrestling over the course uh, of the next couple of years. And the last is this notion of a reticence to innovate. I, I do think that the, the problem here um, or the potential challenge here is, is that in creating this draconian consequence for fiduciary breaches, uh, especially if the breaches weren't actually breaches, uh, probably gets us to an environment where plan sponsors uh, are less likely to do things that might help participants going forward uh, because they don't want to be the first out on the edge to try and pursue those particular approaches. So there's been much written and talked about relative lifetime income. I think this has been an area where plan sponsors uh, have largely been waiting understandably uh, for more safe harbor guidance and, and what would be acceptable before taking on uh, 
uh, the necessary steps that would provide more lifetime income opportunities for participants. Uh, you see a number of people talking about hedging income. So how do I create hedges to my income depending on what I think the inflationary environment is going to be going forward? Again, uh, in a defined contribution setting where we're largely building asset allocations, driving toward uh, a total asset accumulation number at retirement, um, are we creating enough opportunities and innovation to help participants uh, reduce their risks as they transition into retirement? There's been a tremendous amount written about longevity annuities, the notion of uh, purchasing insurance today that would start paying me income if I made it to age 85, 90 or beyond. Uh, and again, I think there's a reticence among uh, plan sponsors uh, to adopt these types of longevity annuities without greater guidance from a regulatory perspective. Uh, the notion of personalized managed accounts, I think we've seen a tremendous increase in the uh, utilization of target date products as QDIAs within qualified plans, and we've seen a number, a very small number of providers uh, a benefit uh, from an asset uh, growth perspective. Um, we're seeing huge movement among the notion to say, well, maybe instead of having one QDI glide path for an entire population, each participant should have their own unique glide path based on their, their circumstances. I think those types of personalized managed accounts that may incur expenses uh, again, are likely uh, to be slow in innovation uh, given lack of guidance and then again, the risk of being out by themselves. And that really falls into that dynamic default where we create an environment where these QDIA target date products create a lot of safety. Um, if we want to make them more dynamic uh, or more reactive to the needs of participants, the needs of the population, or even what's happening in the markets, that would put you on a plan sponsor perspective uh, out potentially on a plank by yourself where you don't want to be. And I think that that's unfortunate. It really drives back to my earlier comments, which is in an environment where we're getting very little uh, in regulatory guidance uh, from the Department of Labor uh, for whatever set of reasons that may be, you know, without that guidance and given the fact that there is a, a, a ongoing specter of litigation relative ERISA claims, it seems then unlikely that you're going to see substantial uh, movement uh, on these innovation ideas over the course of the next couple of years. So hopefully, uh, I'm going to hopefully tell you what I, what I tried to teach you and then uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, for the many of you I know, uh, you'll tell me after the fact if I was successful or not. But ultimately, I'm, I'm hoping that as we look at the litigation, uh, I think it's really critical to understand uh, the importance of that investment selection monitoring process, right? Um, how do we go about the process of analyzing what we're going to offer, uh, selecting those, pro those products that we're going to utilize? monitoring their performance and quality um, over the cycle of their inclusion, uh, and consistently and constantly looking for opportunities to utilize the least expensive version of that strategy that may be available. And when we look back at this uh, conflict of interest or, or managing potential conflicts with our providers, always considering whether non-proprietary investment options uh, would deliver the same result at a lower cost than the proprietary version of the same product. I think, um, I would argue in some cases, you have almost a higher burden, right, in cases where you're using proprietary investment products to prove and demonstrate that the selection process was conscious uh, and not just a result of selecting XYZ record keeper as the provider to your plan. From a governance perspective, if we look back at that NYU case, providing fiduciary training to members of your retirement plan committees is critical. Uh, we've rolled out to our clients a, a multi-year retirement committee education program to help plan uh, committees get further up the learning curve relative the, the highly technical issues that they're going to be asked to weigh in on and make them more effective. Um, having uh, and documenting uh, your meetings and meeting minutes, if we look back on these cases, um, it would be very unfortunate uh, as a committee member to be sitting uh, in a deposition being asked about what happened four and five years ago without a good set of minutes and documentation uh, to help bring you back to that point in time and help you answer the questions that are out there. Um, implementing a fiduciary calendar. Uh, how do we assure that given the myriad of responsibilities that we are faced with as uh, committee members and fiduciaries, uh, 
that we're addressing each of those issues each year in a way that's material and that we can ultimately, the last bullet point, uh, document, document, document. And last but not least, managing our, our vendors. Um, ultimately, I think one of the troubling trends that we see uh, both among record keepers and administrators, but also among um, our peers uh, in the investment consulting market um, is to begin uh, the process of instead of monitoring and surveying the plan, is ultimately manufacturing and doing things that are advantageous. So on the record keeping side, I've already talked about managed accounts and IRA rollovers and immunization. <clears throat> on the investment consulting side, we see similar things where investment consultants are putting together their own target date phone. So instead of managing investment products, they're creating investment products. Instead of managing their providers, they're accepting training and, and uh, skill development from their providers. You know, ultimately, our role as fiduciaries and hopefully the fiduciaries for your plans is to monitor the providers that are involved in the plan and making sure that there aren't any conflicts uh, among those that are serving in that capacity. Certainly formalizing a process um, by which you review fees and services. If I go back to the settlement terms in the University of Chicago, uh, what commercially reasonable means can we use to make sure that the costs we're paying are the right costs relative to services we're receiving? Uh, and understanding both how we pay those fees and how they're allocated to participants at the end of the day. So with that, um, that kind of concludes my prepared remarks. Uh, again, Happy to take uh, questions that you may have uh, or comments over the course. Again, I'm gonna keep them muted, so I'll ask you to use the, the Q&A bar if you have it uh, to address any uh, additional topics uh, or things that may have popped up over today's presentation. Excellent. Well, I, with that, I'm going to let you all go. It, it does appear that the testimony is continuing, so hopefully you haven't missed too much. Uh, again, expect to get uh, a copy of the materials as well as a link to the recorded presentation. Uh, thank you so much for participating um, and look forward to talking to you again very, very soon. Thanks.